Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Please visit audiblepodcast.com slash wizard for your free audiobook download. <coughs> it's January... Fuck. January 23rd, 2013. This is Idle Thumbs 91. I'm Chris Remo. I'm Jake Rodkin. And I'm Sean Vanneman. And we are joined by Sean Elliott. Special guest, Sean Elliott. Yeah, hey, man. how's it going? Hey. So Sean, Hi guys. I worked with Sean for over a year at Irrational Games, but I'm pretty sure just about anybody listening to this uh, Knows him from his Twitter cares feed. about that <laughs> less than the fact that he was on Games for Windows, the podcast, the Birdio, back in the day. And GFW, the magazine. No, uh, that's long gone. I discovered that tonight when my coworker at Irrational, Jason Mojica, was like, yeah. he didn't know that I'd ever been on a podcast. And he's like, why do you get to go? Because this whole thing was he really, <laughs> really wanted to be on the show tonight. Uh-huh. And and he didn't know anything about it. So it was a sobering moment. And I told Jeff Green, a, a former um, yeah, yeah, yeah. podcast member, and he was just like, yeah, that's how it is, man. And he had some, I don't even know, he's too, he's too old for me. Like his, he name checked some like old ass fool that no one remembers. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's fine. You're, and, that, you know. you're that old ass fool now. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the worst. Give us oh. two years. So you guys worked together for a year. Did you guys <laughs> know each other before? before then? Year. Yeah, Just we knew we like... knew each other when we were both game journalists a little bit. But I think we got to know each other. We hung out more at Irrational just because. Yeah, yeah, we were in the same building. Chris in and a, I played the ship last night. <laughs> in a pinch, like, all right, if we need a fucking icebreaker, yeah, just you, say any name of any game. Yeah, we have we'll no structure. No, no, I want to kick this off with this. With it's not so much a game. You can make it a game. It's a, an electronic device known as the Clapper. Uh, many people know this what? from the as seen on television ads. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like been around everybody on the planet. for a long, long time. The thing where you clap and the light goes off. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I got my first clapper after wanting one for several years. I can't shake the feeling that this is a euphemism. I just got <laughs> yeah, I got, got my first clapper. Not the clapper. I mean, no, no. <laughs> this is not a euphemism. The yeah. clapper is the All legit right. thing. Okay. And for context, okay, I'll dress it up. I, I, I fuck that. I'll dress it up afterward. I it's just bare bones. I'm a tight wad. And uh, energy for heating was costing me like three to four hundred bucks a month in Boston. So Wait, hold on. You I were just... like Mr. Star of Quincy Electricity Miser of the Year, according to the yes, the electric yes. After, the utility company. After, so I started off and I was like, <laughs> you, you know, he got, like, he got like a special commendation <laughs> called Miser of the Year. <laughs> when we were <laughs> miser. Star of Quincy Miser like of a, the Year, he got like an official like certificate from the president of the utility, being like, you haven't turned on. So I was bragging that this is great. There's context now. That means I was bragging. I was. You this were, was an achievement like, for me. This was like my version spenders. of like the Christmas story leg lamp that when it finally arrived, <laughs> yeah. and and only because when I first moved there, I found out that I was paying three to four hundred dollars a month. I came from California. Yeah, Previously, yeah, yeah. I'd only ever lived on the West Coast. Yeah. I had no way to you know just like anticipate the the cold or the winter there. So I blew you know. I blew my load on my on my uh, utilities bill, and then after that, I said, "Fuck it, I'm going to try to go like a uh, burly man on this and just never turn the damn thing on." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the just use an electric blanket outside of when you know my girlfriend comes over, like all bets are off. You have to turn the heater on because right. like, women, are, yeah, 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 they ain't yeah. coming over <laughs> if, it's, right, if, it's, right, right. if it's a nice box. So my whole thing was that I had just got an electric blanket and I'd war I'd preheat that before I jumped into bed. And it would be fine. And, you know, when I said it would elevate it, it was like the other night it was nice. I've been rereading Moby Dick and there's this passage in like a third chapter or something when he first meets Queequeg and he shares the bunk with him in uh, in Nantucket. And there's just this sort of uh, dis- discursive passage where he's talking about how you never really appreciate like warmth or anything unless part of your body's cold. And it, I was sitting there at the time with one leg out of the bed freezing and the rest of my body oh, yeah. like completely cozy. And I was like, yes, I totally know. But for that reason, <laughs> the problem arose – that I would be in the exact same situation and I'd need to turn the light off. And like, God forbid, I'd have to get out of the bed oh, yeah, to go turn, the, the, turn the light off. Yeah, to walk through the tundra. So I was like, you know what? I remember that old lady violently <laughs> oh 
clapping. And I saw her on television as a child, and I was like, she's got the fucking solution to my problem. And so <laughs> she does. She does. So I, I got this thing. And it was amazing. I think it might be my first experience with an as seen on TV product. Yeah. And you know, all the commercials for, for these things basically portray normal, like quotidian life as though it's, it's just, just impossible. Comedy of errors. Yeah, it's, just, it's impossible just to fucking. catastrophe lurking around every yes. corner. So what I discovered is that it's actually the opposite that life goes on normally until you buy one of the as, as seen on TV products, at which point it becomes the comedy of errors they depict in their own commercials. Yeah. So in my mind's eye, I'm like, this is simple. I clap my fucking hands, light goes off, I go to bed. And instead, <laughs> the first night what happened was the light wouldn't go off and I'm clapping so, so uh, violently that I scare my cat, runs from the bed where it's the only warm place in the house, you know, so it, it must be scared. <laughs> And Jesus to death. It, eventually, I, I find a way to clap and, and get it to turn off. But then in the middle of the night, and I was recovering from a cold, I wake up coughing, and it turns the light on. And I was like, <laughs> shit. So I start clapping, and I can't get the light back off. And then similarly, I walk to the bathroom, and walking by the thing turns it on. And clapping won't turn it off. And, of course, I wouldn't be telling this story if I didn't feel there's a punchline. And the punchline ultimately came when I was knocking boots. And the booty clap turned the clapper on. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's actually why they call it that. Mid intercourse. And that was probably the last time I used the clapper. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Good story. I'm saying the icebreaker. <laughs> actually, I'm full of shit. Like, I'm, we embraced it after that, and we did. We just renamed it the booty clapper. And so when we want to turn it's, the it's lights like off, a part, it's like disco party. A willing participant will, will present her butts to be slapped. And then That's off, it? Off go the lights. Yeah. You've cracked the code. <laughs> so if you, if you need some spice in your life, the kind that only the clapper and Thomas a MD can provide. Hey, hey, that is, is a my, quality medical professional who happens to work next door to us. <laughs> so tell me, tell me about this guy. On your desk is a card, a guy that to me looks like a little bit like a younger Mark Hamill. And he oh, oh, is... Hold on. A younger <laughs> modern Mark Hamill. <laughs> Well, Mark see. Hamill's looking toe up right now. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean maybe don't like, think of Luke maybe Skywalker. Like a brother, uh, so it's like it's like Wing Commander era Mark Hamill. No, I, I feel well, like maybe like, like a, guy from a month ago. Like Mark Hamill. Okay. <laughs> when when Doctor <laughs> came over, yeah, I feel like he had long hair. Yeah, maybe he, he was more he looked, floppier. Yeah. he looked sort of like a like a like a nineteen seventies salesman who had yeah. a long day. Yeah, not only did he look like that, so he comes over and he's <laughs> and he's like. Hey, hey there. Hey, hey guys. But you did knock on the door. That's important. He, the, the door, door is already open. open. So yeah. he just shows. He sort just of like appears lingers and, and, and like pokes his head in. And Sean and I are in here. And, hey, hello. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm Thomas. I'm uh, next door. I'm your neighbor. Like, oh, hey. Oh, hey, how's hey, man. I'm hey, Chris. how you I'm doing? Sean. Nice to meet hey. you. Great. So, uh, you guys get internet here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you, no, no, no. Hey, do, do you guys have internet? Internet yeah. panhandling? Uh. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's working. Are we good? Yeah, yeah, no, we are. Why? Is it out next door? He's like, no, no, I mean, do you guys have, like, Wi-Fi that I could borrow? I just need to check my email. No, and he's... I'll Here's where I have to pause or, and yeah, say that it, his card yeah, lists yeah. that he has office locations in San Francisco, Berkeley, Walnut Creek, and Danville. <laughs> so the the Wi-Fi cockroach has four offices anyway. Back, <laughs> yeah. back to the so I mean he's yeah. like really sweet and he's well, like, he's like oh, he was really nice and we're like oh yeah here this is the password just use it. Um, well I can pay you. I can, I'll pay you. Oh I let me let me. I'm like no just, man like you're not gonna be downloading any like torrents right? And he's like what? No no not downloading anything just check an email. Like, yeah, no problem, no problem. And then Chris is like, I'm going to take the garbage down. And Thomas sort of lingers, and he's like, anyway, yeah, here's my card. And um, no, you guys seem like really nice guys. So, you know, I'm a therapist. I'm a doctor. If you just ever need to talk to anybody, anybody, just need anything, you want to talk, you need help, you need anything, you know, just, uh, you know, a chat, um, prescriptions, anything. You just let me know. Anyway, bye. <laughs> he threw prescriptions <laughs> <laughs> that in there. Like, hopefully did one of you get meta and just say like yeah can you explain no, he, <laughs> why i feel so uncomfortable right now <laughs> <laughs> and then chris came back and i was still the sort of like shell shot. dumbstruck yeah. in the doorway like you're not gonna i think we so just yeah, what did drugs. you say you stepped out for what what, what was your garbage garbage yeah. take out the garbage and he just sort of, but, but there's no garbage there's no trash can <laughs> right? holding just, an empty bag you, you need fucking awkward <laughs> only like a sock. To leave now. yeah i gotta put the garbage in i got oh, the garbage i'm gonna go check on it <laughs>
he's a super nice guy Presumably. and we all are we're all locked up now with everything we need prescriptions wise which is great so yeah did you ever yeah. call him that's it like like, what does he think? Like, you're going to look like at the right car. car. I mean, we didn't even he probably explain. Is a like, what is the specialization? He's a psychotherapist who specializes in individuals. individuals, couples, teens, and families. A licensed marriage and family therapist. Yeah. So just it's in really case, on he the also odd chance. This episode also, we should probably <laughs> beep out his name. Because we probably get him just, like, whatever, stripped of his medical <laughs> license. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Got anyway. Now I've got to do that. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go with Thomas. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. Fine. How long have you been in town? When did you get in? Um, it's like a week now. A okay. Full week. Yeah. Welcome to the fair city. You yeah. caught it at a good time. Seems really. It's like well, really... from here. Yeah, but I mean, welcome back. But it's been, Yeah, city. I haven't been back in a long time, here? and it's no. I no, I, I grew you... up between San Diego and Seattle, uh, and then I was out here for seven years. And I thought you meant just I... like a random place between San Diego and Seattle. No, no, back in, <laughs> oh, literally <here. laughs> back and forth. Like every yeah, every yeah. like maybe year or two years. I didn't realize back and forth. I grew up in San Diego. I think we had that discussion at some point because yeah. I told you, like, you're familiar with Lakeside, which is always a triumph when someone knows where that's at because that's yeah. where I went to high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you've been done for a little bit and you've had time to play anything cool? Um, in, not since I've been here. I just downloaded, like, I've been the slowest adopter, but I finally downloaded on Wi Fi, uh, Walking Dead. I haven't started oh, cool. it yet. I don't imagine you guys are in the mood to talk about it yet. So, like, I haven't played it yet. I'm going to while I'm here. Cool. Um, Let us know what you think, but not on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but prior to that, I've been. Um, it's probably pretty boring. It's this. You know how it is, right? Like especially when you're yeah. busy, you're always there. There's the the podcast audience that is playing everything the minute it's released, yeah, 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 and yeah. you feel as though you're living in like just this like retarded time where you know I finished uh, Far Cry Three a little bit ago. I've been playing a ton of Planet Side Two. I mean, Which you sound like. more up on stuff than I do, to be honest, right now. Even than you? But yeah. I always see you tweeting about, like, indie games and stuff. And Yeah, I'm playing a lot more small-scale stuff these days, I guess. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. I think I need to get into that. There's that inertia that everyone experiences when you first download a game before you actually turn it on. I mean, does this sound familiar? Right, no, like, no, in totally. a way that you, there's no such thing when you're going to hit play on a movie, or at least if there is, it's not as common. I, I find this is, like... I hear this again well, and again from you people. Know, you feel as though you're investing, you're making mm-hmm, some investment mm-hmm. as though you you're going to finish book. a movie and you're one sitting with it. You know, you're not, you're not, it's not an indefinite commitment of any number of hours that could range between four and 40. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. like you sit down at the game and you're like, all right, this is not, I'm not sitting down to play this game. I'm sitting down to figure out what this game even is. Yeah. You know, and that, that could take any number of hours. And you know that like, well, so I guess similar to like, if you're reading a really engaging and yet complicated book, the more time that passes and in intervals between your reading sessions, that's true. The more frustrating it can be no, to catch, catch up. It's yeah. the same with games, right? No, like if you put true. Dishonored down for like three days and you come back and you're like, halfway through or, or more you probably have to like reacclimate to the controls mm-hmm. and like remind yourself of like what your suite of abilities are oh, yeah well past a certain threshold i'm just ne- i i have to admit to myself i'm never going to play the game again yeah like i i'm i'm beyond one day i'll get back to metroid prime <laughs> you had to finish that game no i put oh, it down God. for like three weeks and came back and didn't know where anything was and then said fuck this and never came back well, that was ten years ago. Yeah, <laughs> I think we it's played still that in my GameCube two sessions. Huh? Yeah. Well, one day I'll get my back to Metroid Prime. He said that was ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. The opening line of your fucking autobiography. Yeah. <laughs> Except yeah. at that point, it would probably be that you're writing right now. Oh, it's today's. Yeah. Um. Yeah. God, I was gonna say something. Else. But no, I have, like I have I downloaded Sleeping Dogs a while ago, and I just can't hit play on it. Because I'm just like I don't. And it's sitting there when like, I'm ready, taking up a ton of right. like gigs. That's, that's you know, gotta be drive. That's gonna be partly yeah. a download thing though, right? Because I don't buy games at retail that often anymore. But when no, I do, I, I come home, unwrap them, and start playing them immediately. Yes, the same yeah. way when I'm a that's kid. It's true. But with Steam, it's like there's the there's the padding of the download, which is yeah. is weird because it's effectively the yeah, same. That's as a new a new metric to track. You know, the, like the install, standard installing metric is, a five CD ROM game in in yeah. 1999 or 2000 still had that, but you were still like. You know, right, waiting, like, you, you the acquired all to do yeah. something. Yeah. Like yeah. And you, you were specifically engaging with that one game, right? right? Whereas with Steam, with Steam like, you have like five other games installing and, and then the a same background time. process will yeah. occur for yeah. X number of hours, and then maybe one day you'll notice the game is there. So, yeah. That is peculiar. Steam's ruined gaming. <laughs> Again. Again. Wow. Well, was, we talked about Greenlight. Oh. I was just trying to, like, trying to piss off Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> this way I find yeah. like I like it's one reason why I put off playing Walking Dead and I jumped right into like you know Dishonored or Far Cry or something is that like 
it's the equivalent of a genre. Like, and I mean, I know there's a world of difference, say, between a Call of Duty and a Dishonored, but for me, it's first person. And as long as it's that, I'm like, I can jump right in, feel confident right off the bat, feel that yeah. I don't have to like, um, you know, learn a ton of new systems yeah, and, sure. and, and become competent. So it's really easy for me to pass, to get over that inertia and just hit play. Whereas like something I don't, I really don't know what to expect. I've heard so much about Walking Dead, but it's like, because it's not like something that I do all the time, which is really a really shitty excuse. Like I hate readers like that, you know, like it's like, and I hate people who eat that way. Right. I hate people right, right. who do everything in their life that way, but that's me with games. You know, it's like yeah. people that eat the same kind of food because it's easy. It's like, I'm totally the opposite. I, I'll eat like whatever this, I always ask like, what do you want? Just order for me, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Well, it's funny is like making a game like that. You're just like, nobody's going to fucking play this. Like, no, you know what I mean? Cause you're like, are you, are we going to be able to get over that expectation hump? Yeah. Of what people are going to expect out of this game. That's right. The, like, the ability to people, people to sort of like meditate and have an image of what the experience of playing this game is yeah. before they actually play. And I have, I, this is interesting, right? I have none for, uh, for walking dead. I just don't know what to expect. Well, with food, the only difference is going to be the sensory part of it. Whereas games, the difference is like, how do you make something happen in the game? Yeah. You know, like you don't have to learn how to different forks. How do you make something happen with the food? I guess you kind of do. There's chopsticks. There's different, like, there's different, like, give me diarrhea. How do I make it happen? But, like, that stuff's all, like, on the back end. Like, you don't have to deal with any of that stuff yeah. actively. It just happens to you. It might be disastrous. Sometimes but, when you yeah. find a food that you don't know how to eat is kind of hilarious, That's though. true. That's like, true. Yeah, the first time you ever, like, go to Oysters or something up in Tomas Bay, and you're just like, yeah. What, what what do we do? How do we? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's open like now. It's say, open. It's say open you're now, like a Bedouin, <laughs> yeah. you know, of like from Saudi Arabia, and then you're having your first crab dinner. You know, like that's yeah, kind yeah, of that's yeah, as right, close right, as it right, gets yeah, to yeah, exactly. Really good. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like Bedouin crab dinner. <laughs> that's perfect. That's a perfect shorthand <laughs> for what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, what, so I don't know if you guys want to talk about over the over the what has gotten you over the the hump to actually play something with different games. There, just it's recently, always like, just two things. It's like one, if it's a, if it's, if it's an FPS, it's just the easiest thing in the world, which is sad because I play games I'm not really excited about just for that reason. Oh no, I've done that as and, well for sure. I've in the last couple of years I've kind of fallen off doing that because it's I've if, with F, and FPS specifically because they're the ones that are tend to be the most like each other mm-hmm. just in the base way you move around the world. Absolutely, you know? the core verbs are like so like similar that you can everything else is something you learn in addition to it. Yeah. And then the other big motivator is just like, you know, the social aspect, like friends, you know, peer pressure. Like that's how I got in Planet Side 2. If I hadn't been following mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, I was aware that it was coming out and it was like a group of my friends just jumped in and started playing and immediately I had to be part of that. So like the, the multiplayer aspect, as long as you have like that group and you hit a critical mass on it, will always drag people into anything. Oh, for sure. Well, last night we were playing the ship and like if you guys, I wouldn't have bothered loading that up if you guys hadn't just happened to have been around. Like, I didn't even have it downloaded. Um, but uh, I don't know. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. It was, yeah. was super You've never fun. played it before. Yeah, no, I've been talking about the ship for some I've, reason. I've played a lot of the ship. Oh, you yeah. have? Yeah, okay, I cool. can join in on this conversation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd never played it before. We had, yeah, a couple podcasts ago it came up as a, as just like a Because a, everyone a everyone who's ever come anywhere near contact with the ship somehow has like 300,000 gift copies of it. So Yeah. yeah. So um, we were playing it last night, and I had no idea what to expect with that game at all, but it's fantastic. Like yeah. I really, really enjoyed the game, and we were also we were playing on Skype. So like, like there was only three of us, and then we filled the rest of the ship with bots. Yeah. But we started a, a Skype call, so we were all talking to each other, which I yeah. think added an element of it that was it did. tremendous. The, the The funny thing about that is, uh, it was like it felt to me like the equivalent of Did you guys ever play like Halo split screen back in the yeah, day? Of like same screen. Yeah. Um, I I used to play that game in a, in a buddy's house where we had two Xboxes in two different rooms and there was a wall like in between us and we'd both be resting against Presumably the same wall. Presumably made of cardboard? <laughs> Basically, I yeah. I hope it was. No, no, no. It was two <laughs> legit rooms but it might have well, as well been cardboard. You hear everything completely. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, you'd, we'd play team versus team in the two rooms and, you know, you'd headshot a guy and then you'd go, God damn it! And the wall behind <laughs> you would like thump. Right. And what was funny about playing the ship is that the way that game works, when you, when you see someone... You, unless you've gotten within a certain tight proximity of them, you don't know who they are. But even once you do find out who they are, all you know is their fictional assigned in-game name. You don't know what player it is until you've identified them. And so you, you explained the premise of this game in a previous episode? Yeah, um, I forget if we have. Only Just so people should, know what we're talking about. Yeah. Right, right, right. This is a game where every you're, it's basically like the real-world game assassin. Like 
you are given a target who is another randomly selected person on the server, and everyone else is also given a target. So you're going to be the target right. of somebody else as you're hunting. You're hunting and being hunted. That may or may not be the same person. It's completely right. random. And you're... It's like Secret Santa. Yeah. You're wa- you're walking around this three-deck ship uh, with weapons that you find throughout, you know, uh, axes, hammers, uh, knives, anything. And you're essentially trying to covertly murder the person who is your target without getting spotted by guards or other players or whatever. You can get tossed in jail for having a weapon exposed or if a guard sees you kill someone or attack someone. Um, so you're trying to do it with a, with a, without being detected. So you guys are playing with just three people and bots? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Which is funny, not the way to do it. No, it's, but it's, no, not, but it's, it's absolutely not. It was, not. It was a tell leverage your audience funny to thing, fill your server up. No, yeah, no that's yeah. what we're going we're gonna well, to do. Yeah, yeah. We got given um, uh, 300 codes. After we mentioned it on our podcast, the developer gave us 300 codes to give away. So each we have of, those, to find codes, a way each to of like, those codes also expands out to five copies of oh the game. God. So yeah. we, so we, we just have to find a way to yeah. mask You know they made a, a sequel of Swords too, right? That Ubisoft published. We, yeah, the um, Bloody Good Time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Not well, to sidetrack, but just, no, I know, it's I another thing that, yeah, that's yeah. out there. Um, but anyway, so the thing that was, that was interesting about playing with bots is that just by the virtue of probability, most of the time when you got a target, it would be a bot. Like just they were, we were outnumbered by them. So... Most of the time, when you would when you track down your target and kill them, it would be just a computer opponent who's now dead. But what was really funny is that we'd be all talking to each other on Skype, and when you when you'd manage to to just smash a guy in the face with an axe, my my brain I was acclimated to the idea that this was just going to be a bot every time. And then suddenly, like you or Adrian would be like, "God damn it!" on the Skype thing, and I'm like, "Oh shit! It was, <laughs> oh, it was a guy! It was, it was a guy you there. all along!" Suddenly, yeah. this moment that I expected to be very <laughs> mundane became like very valuable and and memorable yeah this is why yeah i don't play games with bots and i always sort of get bummed out when i hear that the next big patch is about introducing bot support yeah because it's like well that's no. one of those that's one of those philosophical it's fun to stick to that... axe in, in someone you know or yeah, someone you don't yeah. know but a bot like i mean that's the great part of the game right for me i always looked at it as like it's it's role playing in the truest sense for me Absolutely. as far as interactive role playing because you and it's also stealth, like in in plain view. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can engage in traditional stealth where you're trying to block lines of sight and stuff so that someone isn't technically aware that you're following. But it's even better if you can look inconspicuous, be in the, look yeah. inconspicuous and yeah. be like right within their you know their field of view. And so it's like, how do you convince someone that you're not following them and that you're not a threat despite the fact that you know you're you're just looking for the first opportunity when you're alone? And you get the chance to poison them, kill them, you know, catch yep. them trying to take a nap or trying to eat or trying to take a shit, you know, because all those like uh, bodily needs be- govern your, you know, yeah. Yeah. your ability to like flee forever. Well, I, I love all the the, uh, the bodily system stuff because I <laughs> it took me a while to remember how big of a part of, of the game that was. And I'd, I'd get in these situations where I'd be tracking some guy for five minutes straight and then I realize my guy is just – on the verge of collapse, hasn't taken a shit in like an hour. It's yeah. just, there's fl- the, the game will actually spawn flies around you when you haven't bathed in a certain amount of time. And you're looking at him, you're trying to gauge, you're like, is he just desperate to find a bathroom or does he suspect that I'm onto him? Right, so yeah. he's unwilling to, to take the, it's, the risk of... Yeah, the, and the, the fact that there's no direct communication, all the communication is purely through interactivity mm-hmm. and that's expressed by just like how people are moving, where something as simple as where they're looking. It's, yeah, it's really interesting just to... There's nothing better than following somebody into the bathroom, though, in that game, and just closing the door behind you. <laughs> that satisfying, like, click of the door. Yeah. And be like, it's on, motherfucker. <laughs> like, it's so the are you, have you been on the other end of that, where you're taking a shit, and you hear the bathroom door go click and go, <gasps> oh, fucked. How did you kill, God, was it you or Adrian that killed me in such a dis- despicable way? I think it was in the bathroom or in the shower or somewhere. Oh, it was the worst. It must not have been you the way you're looking at me. No. But yeah, it was that sort of thing where I was just like, da 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 <gasps> Like, oh, it's you! <laughs> Bad dad! And then just like maniacal laughter on the... On maniacal? The, uh, mani- <laughs> maniacal laughter on the Skype. Speaking of, speaking of, oh, it's you, I... Uh... I followed someone into. I followed it. Or no. Oh my. God. Yeah. I I went into the bathroom and there was a girl already in there on the toilet who was not my target. Then this other my then my target coincidentally walked into the bathroom and I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. And, and so you didn't know was, the the woman on the taking a shit. You were her target. No. So, so she wipes, stands up, and follows <laughs> you. <laughs> no. So then I close the door and the guy goes over to the toilet. So I get up and I just take out an axe and just 
just massacre him. And then as I turn around, the woman is there swinging a severed arm at me. <laughs> oh it was amazing. It was, Why was she doing that? I guess that's a weapon that you... Or, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a but was she trying arm, to kill you? a mannequin arm that you can I guess get she from was. a oh, so lingerie right. store. Yeah, I mean, I guess so, yeah. Or it was just a poor player, because you can... I mean, you're of course, you're free to attack anyone you want. The consequence is that you're placed no, in true. jail. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. when you're sitting in jail, clearly you're not able to go and kill anyone. Well, but what's funny about... What's cool about jail, though, is that that's your time to have a little more safety to actually get a plate of food and sleep... Yeah. And go to the bathroom. Like that, yeah. You just do all your bodily stuff while you're. Yeah, yeah that actually clink. becomes. It's a weirdly valuable experience to go to prison. You can, you can get cornered when you come out. You, you can, can play shine. some metagames yeah. too. Yeah. Like if you start to have like a, uh, ventrilo alliances, you know, mm-hmm. like where a couple of you, you basically quietly agree that you're going to run as a pack. And like help one another, provided you oh, go. God. You yeah. want to sign oh, one man. another, but like yeah. that's always it's, that's the oldest trick in the book. I always did that. You play team deathmatch. You get in with your friends, and you all agree to like never attack one another. <laughs> you, you just run the board. <laughs> Someone inevitably turns though when you do that. Someone gets bored. Yeah. Yeah, could be. I don't know. I think we we sort of uh, yeah. It's amazing. Maybe you have one real turn. Friends. Maybe I have your friends. Turn. I always like turn. Oh God. Yeah. Turn well, you turn, but then it's like Neptune's you reset it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Neptune's it usually goes that? through. There's like a one revenge cycle, you know, and then you yeah. get your revenge. You're satisfied. Okay, come on. Yeah, did, did you ever play the game Neptune's Pride? It was a web game. It was no. uh, It was oh, made man. by Jake Hybers, who is ex irrational. It's a uh, it's but, a uh, really like it's, it's a like galactic conquest game from a super super macro level. But the rate of play is incredibly slow. Like you'll launch ships to a planet, and then you just have to come back in six hours when they get there. Yeah. Uh, it's really fascinating. And I mean, it's, it's, there's only, I mean, there's one winner and then one second place and one third place. I mean, it's a straight down the line by who controls the most stars at the end of the game. I think that's what the metric yeah. is. Um, but there's a diplomacy system that is codified in the game where you can actually strike alliances, but inevitably there are. There's also a shadow diplomacy system through yeah. the chat. And Which is always systems. more interesting than, of course, than the one that's supported it is, through a system. It is brutal in that game. I mean, it gets. People get. Well, because it's, it's, it's a multiplayer it's, game, but it's meant to just be checked, you know, a couple times a day. Right. But those times a day are dictated by what, like, when your build cycles are done exactly. or when your ships arrive. So yeah. people just go through these insane cycles, like late game of that which is like three or four days in people are getting up at four in the morning to mm-hmm. check uh oh, it's yeah. bad and you can just ruin somebody because this is the thing an alliance can never last until the end of the game fully because someone's gonna have to someone, be, yeah there's a the last man standing first, yeah, yeah and it just gets shit gets yeah. raw it gets bad yeah. that sound i remember like, i did that in warcraft 2 now that i think of it too where we'd play a four-person game and three of us would immediately just all gang up on oh, one God, person. Yeah. And instantly they're, they're begging, ally up, ally up. Yeah. Oh, man, ally up. Yeah. Sorry, fool. Star- Star- <laughs> Star- <laughs> that was my experience yeah. in StarCraft as well. That was, I forgot about that entirely. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, Neptune's Pride 2, I've, it's called something else. Neptune's Pride 2? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're making, working on it. Yeah. yeah, they're making a new game. Yeah. God. It so what's really the, interesting to me. What's yeah. the pride of Neptune? What's the pride of Neptune? Yeah, the titular pride of Neptune. Just stabbing your friend right in the kidneys. God, that keeps, <laughs> that's all you do. Yeah. Oh, I mean, Nick Herman almost cried. Nick Brecken is the most brutal Neptune's pride player. Well, he's the most brutal far. person I know. That's true. Yeah. But he was... He was that, just, you, you should expect it by now, though, right? So why wouldn't you all basically just... Brecken's not to be trusted. Because yeah. he. this is the thing. He's so ruthless that it's good to be on his side like yeah, for some okay. amount of time. It's... I don't know. It's fucked up. There's a weird psychology that goes on. Yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> you have Stockholm Brecken syndrome. I know. Yeah. 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 Anyway, <laughs> so what's uh, what's the deal with Planet Side Two? Um, none of you have played it. No, uh, no. So uh, have you played? Ba- I mean, you're used to Battlefield series, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Battlefield at its most like enormous and grand, and all of the problems that people that come with that. Just the um. You know, when people, when I think of like the, the largest scale battlefield maps that I played throughout the history of the franchise, not mm-hmm. in any one particular installment, but is usually you have all the players are kind of like spread heterogeneously across the map. So there's like a couple guys at one point, and there's a couple guys over here, and it basically feels like a bunch of small scale games. Mm-hmm. Um, and Plant Side is like if you take this, the largest battlefield map that's ever existed, and that would basically be just like one control point. Mm-hmm. In in a game where there's a, a three continents all together, and each continent is about you know fifty times the size of the largest battlefield map, and just based on like the systems and the way that things are organized, and the fact that there are three factions fighting against one another, 
it's always your time to action is effectively nil if you want it to be. Right. You know, if you look at the map, if you look at what your platoon, if you join a platoon is doing, you can jump into something immediately. So in the dumb sense, the easiest the easiest thing to say about the game is the scale is like uh, it's awe inspiring. You know, you can be in the middle of a battle and you look and there are like 35 aircraft fighting one another in the sky or giving you air support. You have a column of tanks that's like 55, like thick and deep, like trundling down a valley to this base to go storm it, you know. And the more interesting um, stuff happens is like sometimes, sure, there's like a platoon leader in Ventrilo or something, and this mm -hmm. stuff is like being guided or directed. But I think for the most part, it just kind of emerges, you know. Um, you see like, hey, there's three tanks going down this hill. I'm going to be much safer if I go with them. I'm also going to be a target for aircraft. So you join them. And next thing you know, there are just hundreds and hundreds of guys on your side all going to kick the shit out of a base that would normally take hours and hours to take, but, um, I mean, to, to capture and, and convert to your side. And even the mechanics there are interesting. I could explain some basics. So, like, they have, like, one category of terrain you can capture is called a tech plant. And it will have basically like a citadel wall with shields around it. And the shields are, you know, if um, the faction that holds that territory can pass easily through them. But no vehicles can pass through from opposing factions, but infantry can. So if you go through with infantry and you take down the shield generators, then you could drive your vehicles in. But you can have certain classes of vehicles that have shield spo uh, spoofs that are also spawners. So you can sneak one in there and try to, like, hide it and, like, immediately spawn a bunch of guys. There's, like, a big tower with, like, anti-aircraft batteries and stuff. And it all ends up... Up working together so that like all of the all the vehicles in play all the infantry classes um like another example in that case would be there's an infiltrator which is your traditional sniper except it can hack um hack like turrets and spawners and stuff like that so you just have these red moments where it's, it, it's just happening spontaneously you drop out of a, a ship that's flying over this base you hack all their turrets and then you jump on their turrets and as they're trying to get reinforcements or spawning them from within the base you shoot them down right there guys take the shields down all that giant tank column I described pours in and it's just like a swarm of fucking bees that suddenly just yeah. take this thing. And then an hour later you'll have lost that because the same thing happened to you and they took it back. Uh, so it's really, I mean, it's, it sounds like a scale of game design that just does not happen anymore for the most right. part. How many yeah, people you, like, or has never many, happened? Like, like, oh, but I mean, even something close to it, right? Like in a server. server. Yeah. yeah. I don't even know the number. It's got it's got to be huge though. I, we call them roach hives whenever we, cause sometimes we, we fly what's called a liberator. Um, and it's basically the equivalent of like a space helicopter, you know, you have a, how, you have a howitzer <laughs> on it. And when we see a roach hive, which will be just like countless, uh, infantry on the ground, you know, they're coming out of a Sunder, which is like a mobile spawn point and they're attacking something. And we just start going fucking crazy because you just see the, the score potential and you start raining down howitzer shots on them. And, and again, you know, unlike that mission in Call of Duty where you're shooting bots, which was great, right. like, you know, you're like pissing off like 55 people, like, in a, <laughs> and, and they all want to take you down and they've got great uh, means to do it, but right. it just becomes this, like, it feels really subversive to do something, even though it's technically not overpowered, you know, but right. it's like, you just find the opportunity to do it. Yeah. And, and you're right. Like this kind of game, I, I'm totally behind it because I can think of how many you know studios would say there's so many deterrents against making this variety of experience how yeah, many people sure. are going to jump in they're not going to be part of a large group they're just going to wander around it's going to be chaotic they're not going to understand where they should go they're going to feel like they're dying again and again and basically make a game that gets better the more you play with other people yeah because like a lot of people want to have their cake and eat it too and so that will prevent them from ever having a game like this in the first place because there's just no way to get around the fact right. that yes this game is strictly superior if you're playing with friends than it is if you just jump in on your own right. yeah for sure i mean that sounds very similar in a in in not mechanically necessarily but in that particular sense like Day Z or something which is one right. of those games where it's kind of just a, if you, it ends up you never get that that inertia that you describe unless you've got someone to sort of shepherd you. I mean, Daisy's a little different because you don't actually need dozens and dozens of people in a server to make it a worthwhile experience. Right. But if you do just wander into it on your own out of nowhere, you are just going to die a lot and get lost, not know what you should be looking for or what you're trying to do. Right. And sort of uh, subsumed by the very like esoteric. Yeah, but just the, there's just the crushing weight of the potential of the game yeah. that you can feel is just far beyond your ability to, to, to hold yeah. on to, you know, I mean, it's just, that's a feeling that is really, um, 
it is essentially not allowed for the most part in mainstream yeah. games. It's also a thing now. you only really get out of a large scale multiplayer game that doesn't have an MMO structure that isn't all yeah. questy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That like willingness to embrace like the fact that there's skills to mature and to develop and there's expertise to you know to hone is what keeps you playing over time and that's ultimately what you want, you know. And like I can jump in a game and it's like sure that if you were shooting for an aircraft experience that anyone can grab the the mouse and keyboard or the controller and feel like as though they're completely competent chances are that there's really nowhere to go with that skill right whereas like the skill ceiling is fucking tremendously high in this game yeah like every time i play it's like i look at the game differently one week than i did the week before just because like whole new windows of opportunity well, have opened and i love that and i love the fact that they were willing to do that and what's funny about that is that I think that's ground that used to actually be held by first-person shooter games like Tribes and Quake 3 and so yeah. on. Even Battlefield 42, now, like, it, yeah. like flying yeah, no, yeah, was like yeah, a yeah. select, you know, like right. I think it's Secret Forces, like the Fletner helicopter. There's like, you know, one in, I'd say, 100 players no, can actually totally. do that yeah, without Battlefield exploding. 42 for sure. Um, but I feel like since the early 2000s, that's been kind of seeded to a different category of multiplayer game, which now I would say would be games like Dota and League of Legends. And like mm-hmm. those are those are now the games that seem to be in the mainstream and operating with that just limitless skill ceiling. Yeah. You know, but there are very, very few shooters that's, that still work that way now. Because, And I I guess it's just because they became such a mainstream genre that that, I don't know exactly why that happened, but uh, I guess along with that comes certain expectations of accessibility. But I don't know, this sounds really intriguing. I'm surprised that I've never played a Planet Side yeah. game before. It's free to play, so I would jump in. Yeah. And I would, I just the, the fact that I've spent like probably $75 on it already, it's like the only free-to-play game I've spent a penny Where on. does the money go in that game? Uh, there's a really interesting upgrade system. So um, you get points and you can uh, acquire certification points just through skilled play, you know, mm-hmm. just comp- completing objectives, getting kills and stuff like that. And you can also buy, I don't even know what they're called, station bucks or something. I just call them space bucks. And you can then, you can use space bucks to unlock a class of weapon. So, for example, like if there was a shotgun I really wanted, I can use space bucks to get that weapon, but I can't upgrade it in any way, shape, or form without cert points that are through play. So it's like I can't put scopes on it and this and that. You know, mm-hmm. I can't, um, I can't buy like all these different like pieces of equipment that are specific to my class. I can't like a different airframe for my aircraft, but I can buy access to photon pods or something or rocket pods. But mm-hmm. again, like every single thing, there's just like tons and tons of customizability within every you know vehicle class and every weapon and they feel it doesn't feel as though they basically broke the shit out of everything and you're you're paying for full right. functionality over That's time kind of it feels as though you're like yeah. increasing the ways that you can approach things i mean like like i plan that well, one of the, there's three factions and the faction i play is called vanu and like if you look at stats and stuff like reddit you know people are like excellent at just like pouring through everything just to right. find any any case they can make about a weapon being overpowered <laughs> like the best weapon for like vanu heavy is just the stock one um but you can, you know, you can support different play styles, and it's totally meaningful to do that with right. different weapon sets and stuff, you know. Um, so that, yeah, that's pretty much like what you spend your money on. Mm-hmm. It's tempting that's in that kind of game though, because you know how it is, right? You get killed by uh, a bomber, right. and you're like, "Fuck, I want to do a bomber, but I want to do what he just had." So right. then you go yeah. buy that and shortcut your way to that, and then a fucking anti-aircraft platform yeah. takes you down. And you're like, "Well, I want to do that," and then you go buy that, and then you're the anti-aircraft, and then you get sniped. You know, and yeah, I want that gun, and yeah. it just—it's an endless cycle. They roll out more content, with, like as the they're, they're on. going to over time, and yeah. like you know, I'm only speaking as a fan, and like from what I've seen, like on their forums and their community page. But one interesting possibility that they they sort of teased was that they would stitch all like i said there are three continents and that the, right now you have to go through what's called a warp gate so that they're effectively like they're isolated kind of and, and that they're going to stitch them all together with oceans and so that there will be you know naval aspects there will oh, be shit. like flying carriers and islands and stuff between them and God, like that's outrageous yeah wow holy shit <laughs> it's worth jumping into again like just the, the warning is that like I, I honestly had fun the very let's first time I played. Here, so let's yeah, do man, this. Let's, let's do it. fucking do it. Yeah, we got to do yeah, it. Yeah, lock and load. It just <laughs> run around yeah. is like, it's so, I mean, the player, player is narratives that emerge are just incredible. Is there some sort of skill that's just sort of like, yeah, how would you start? Like, can you just like medic it up and just like run around and be like, are you okay? Like an engineer, be like, oh, I'm just going to fix they, this. That <laughs> support classes have probably a better time in this game than any other shooter I can think yeah. of because of the sheer numbers, right? Like if you find right. an offensive on the map and you look and you're like, Oh my god, there's like 300 people taking this one point. Oh and god. you go there as a medic. Just go there as it's a just like, yeah. 
I mean, even yeah. look at YouTube's after, you know, like uh, sometimes just look at a YouTube of like a, you know, biggest tank calm or biggest air battle or something. And it, it's just, it looks like real, it's sobering. I think it, too, I've tried flying right. like a fighter in one of those like fur balls. And it's like, my lifespan is going to be about like, is measured in seconds. Right. Like how the fuck did people, do people right. actually do this? You know, right. like right. in oh, real I heard life. It's like, like a video game. Yeah. Did you see that <laughs> shit from Prince Harry today? What? Oh my God. You didn't see this shit? <laughs> no. What? I Prince saw- Harry flew a helicopter and shot da- shot Taliban and then compared it to a video game. Oh, well, it also is. called the worst thing ever. So, so Fuck. He, he, in response to a question, he's like, "Yeah, I guess I would say I enjoy war. You know, I'm the kind of person who really likes playing Xbox and PlayStation, and this is pretty much like that." That's oh that's what he that's fucking what he said. said. That's not. I'm not exaggerating what yeah. he said. That's what he said. If he's anything, an I say he's going to give a bad name to like uh, air forces. Because certainly, yeah. certainly, if a tree doesn't think or talk that way, what he did in doing is make the Taliban sound really smart. Because they, yeah, that was the weirdest thing. Did about you read it? their yeah, response? They're like, "Oh, this is real. It's horrible. War is bad, yeah. and yeah. it sucks." Yeah. Like it was like this really like yeah. measured. Well, look, I mean, like when you're in the statement. cockpit of an Apache and you're miles out looking through an IR screen at something. Well, that's the thing, right? Or when even yeah. worse, you're behind the console behind a Predator drone. It's right. certainly not. Well, the that same was the as thing that on the initially was so affecting, and I think like just universally uh appreciated about the the one the ac 130 in call, call of duty, duty first yeah. modern warfare game call of duty 4 like i think that at the, what's a shame about that to me is that now that is just some, simply become just a paint by numbers trope in military themed yeah. games but the first time it's the new turret sequence yeah exactly but the first time that appeared in that game i think it was really sobering at least it was for me when i, I know, played totally. it the i walked away from that experience it. and just went well that's what that's like had you seen shit. like the like live link videos of yeah, actual yeah, 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 yeah i yeah, really yeah, suspect yeah. that yeah. what it had that re- you had that response because you had seen comparable real that life was about footage the same that might be the time, case right? yeah. and i know when i watched those video. three guys i visited yeah. their yeah. studio when i saw that real shit out, and they were like oh yeah we found this video and we made this based on that. Yeah. yeah right and when you see the real shit it's really it's like deeply disturbing it's like oh, the shit that like it messes you up for a week you know no so i not if you're Harry. Yeah. And it's no fucking problem, apparently. God. <clears throat> this is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was bizarre. So. Anyway. You I hear you're really good at your space <laughs> helicopter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dude, I'm just, it's just in the context of video game. Yeah. Over here. Video games. No, this week's episode is sponsored by Audible, and we'd like to thank them for doing so. Uh, you can visit audiblepodcast.com slash wizard and get a free audiobook if you sign up and uh yeah it'd be a good way to get involved with the other book club what you yeah. say chris if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash wizard you will uh you'll get a free book and then you'll also get a free month of their subscription service yeah so the way it works is depending on what like plan level you have you get x number of Free audiobook downloads per month. Yeah, it's kind of uh, like Netflix is yeah, a way of the, kinda, the business yeah. model. I don't know. I had an audio. Um, I'm an, an Audible subscription for a while, and actually, I, I went on like a three week road trip and used it a ton with my wife. And uh, coincidentally, we read books for the Audible Book Club on a monthly basis. Oh my god, we totally it's do. Almost like we? they made this service for the Audible Book Club. Yeah, and yet they're advertising it on our video game podcast. <laughs> but whatever, <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry, it's, it's all fine. part of the plan. <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna read. Um, a book called By Blood next month by Ellen Ullman. We have no idea what to expect from it because none of us have read it, and we're really excited about it. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, we found that'd it just be a good because one. you you thought the cover was striking, right? And then you kind of looked up. I literally and judged book a book was judged by, by its cover. cover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but then I, I saw it said it was it's set in San Francisco and it's written by a former female computer programmer, which is just an she's still female. Like, she's for, a former for computer, fiction, programmer, computer programmer, probably still a programmer. She's unusual. a female computer programmer who wrote a book in fiction set in san francisco so like we we were obligated to read it yeah so you can but have if you somebody want to f- read it to you it's on there we looked yeah yeah for sure also uh uh yeah. we're gonna read um in april i guess we're gonna read wolf hall yeah that is uh on there as well you know i'm just for the heck of it i might actually because wolf hall is a little longer read right it, it's pretty it's you might have read, someone yeah. read wolf it to you. i might audible like, yeah, this man, week because i, week, I, I drive 20 same, minutes you might audible podcast.com slash wizard that book yeah yeah I'll yeah. be curious. That I'll, Wolf Hall, um, none of you guys have read that, I don't think, but that, no, that is but one I'm, of my favorite novels of the last. Do you years. think it would be? It's a really incredible. Not book. to not to go off into idle book club land, but do you think it would be a mistake 
to listen to it as opposed to read it? Because some books you kind of want to read and some books you kind of want to listen to. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'll do it and we'll see. Actually, yeah. speaking of that, the people on the Idol forums said that the read uh, the audiobook of Telegraph Avenue, which is a book that we did a few months ago, mm-hmm. is actually really, really good. And some people said oh, that cool. the, just mm-hmm. the way that it's read yeah. added to it in, in a specific way because the language that feels a little bit funky to some people yeah. actually came out natural in the audiobook, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So listen to that. You know what I'd be curious to hear? I mean, we're just talking about auto book club books, but whatever. Um, it's I would our be, podcast. I would, yeah, I would be interested to hear the audiobook of The Sense of an Ending, which is on, I checked and it's on audiblepodcast.com slash wizard. Um, and just because that book is feels so conversational right. in a way. I mean, it's a one-sided conversation, mm-hmm. obviously, entirely. But That's actually why I really like listening to Sarah Val's books. Mm. Um in audio form, yeah, yeah. She reads them. It reads like you're, you're being up. casually addressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've only read one of hers. I've read um, probably Assassination Vacation. Yes, yeah, yes. which is tremendous. Yeah. Probably my favorite, actually. I mean, uh, take the cannoli is also something about a cannoli. God, I can't remember it. That one's also good. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, search for cannoli. Go to audiblepodcast.com/slash/wizard and, and listen I think, to books. I think even if you even if you don't stick with the. Um, the subscription, you still have to keep the audiobook, that your free one that you get. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny that. But I have had the app on my phone yeah. recently, and it's really well made. So yeah. I, I can vouch for that. Cool. But uh, thanks for our sponsors, and thanks to you guys. Oh, yeah, and idlebookclub.com as well if you want to check out our, our book club podcast. What? I almost I almost said double plug, and then I heard myself <laughs> say it, and then I didn't say it. <laughs> you said it. You said it. But that's not going to be on the podcast. Yes, yes it, it is. is. It's the name of this Can we be sponsor. back with Sean Elliott episode? Now, <laughs> what? Can we be back with Sean Double Plug Elliott back? You found your Idle Thumbs nickname. <laughs> here it is. It's oh been bestowed God. upon you. No, That's we how it works here. Video game. Double Plug. And we're back. And we're back. Oh, are we, are we back now? Yeah, Jake. We're back now. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Hey, Sean. We're back now. You, can you tell that this was like a 20-minute break? Someone shit their brains out. We yeah. completely lost all momentum. <laughs> it's all we gone We've completely now. forgotten where we were at. Yeah. Oh, we were talking about video games on a podcast. I think so. We took a Sounds break. Familiar. We watched some, some, some Planet Side videos. Chris yeah, yeah. and I both had our faces blown in. And now we're uh, going to play that video jump in. Yeah. And then so you can storm. I'll look for your rage tweets. Yeah. Your first experience. <laughs> Yeah, just the, the actual just experience of just Jughead, just horrible, just into the breach, just get your fucking face chewed Let's off go. immediately. Yeah. yeah, I just always yeah. think when you play this kind of games, if you find yourself right. in a meat grinder, yeah. like you're opting into it, right? Yeah. yeah, like you have. Remember, you can look at the map and choose any other experience you want. If, if suddenly you're in, a, in, a, in an offensive meat grinder, find a good defensive battle where the odds are stacked in your favor, meaning it looks like. You, the, you know, it's like three to one presence of your army compared to theirs, and go have fun. You know, I wish you could just spawn to the outskirts and be war photographer. Just <laughs> if you want to oh, do actually, screenshots, dude, that's what print screens for. You know, like I was actually going to ask about that. Do they, do they have any sort of demo recording the stuff? tools in the game? I, they they might. I haven't looked. Like, I feel totally spoiled at this point by Source Filmmaker existing yeah. for Valve games, but Source Filmmaker for like or an equivalent for Planet Side Two would be a fucking disaster of YouTube quality. Yeah, yeah, I would. It's worth taking a look at. I would. It's one of those things where it's like there's so many moments, priceless moments that are going to be occurring. You know, every play session that yeah, but if it's not there, people are going to be frapsing like crazy. If they, so if they offered an eighty dollar probably... embedded journalist mode where you could just <laughs> yeah. where you could just get yeah. zoom and uh yeah. press credentials <laughs> <laughs> you get to, you can you have the ability to go inside an opponent's base but you have no offensive capability right exactly yeah, right, you're just right, there right. Yeah. Amnesty and, and, yeah. yeah so um to get on to another topic uh like i mentioned that i've been playing far cry 3 recently yeah, right. i don't necessarily want to get into the nitty-gritty about everything about that game but i found that we've, we've um, talked about it a lot because i also assume that you've talked about it a lot uh, but I found that the, some of the things I liked most about the game were good sort of like launching pads for just thinking about the kind of experiences that I want to see more or I want to yeah. make more. And um, I think 
I, I, I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room expressed like their satisfaction with the moments when they watched the wildlife interacting in surprising ways. You oh, know, yeah. With, yeah, with one another, yeah. with the player, yeah. like the moment when uh, you shoot a pa- shoot one member of a pack of dogs and suddenly they turn bitch as though you're taking out the alpha, but then they continue to bark in a circle and then the barking lures a car in and stuff. But it made me, for some reason, I made this jump to, um, I think... Like the the best moments I have in in games, and when I look back on my favorite moments in games, they're when I ex- understand the world through interactivity. So it's like narrative via interactivity, and it's like uh, one example. And I, and I know at least among you, Remo and Gainer, uh, Half Life Two is not you know you don't put that game on a pedestal, but I, I return to it a lot because like uh, in Half Life Two proper, there's the moment when you discover that if you step on the sand, you will alert ant lines and they will emerge, yeah. and if you step on metal plates you're safe. And then similarly, as you go up that hill, you see this machinery thumping around and there's no audio logs. There's no one telling you what's going to happen. If you frob this thing, you interact with it and then you observe the result, you observe the outcome and you've added that much to your understanding of the way the game works. And so I found, and I was looking, I was like, I'm having so much fun with these animals. It really made me think of like a game that was it kind of like vibe, like it's almost like out of this world or something, you know, where uh, there's, there's no dialogue, at least at first, you know, there's, there's not people explaining how things work and you, you get everything just through interacting with it. And mm-hmm. it seems like, Oh, this is an alien, but then you learn something more about it and you start to see, you know, I'm presupposing that there's like a very interesting ecosystem here in the first place sure, and that right. there's novel ways for like creature a, you know, if we take it to sci-fi for creature a to interact with creature B and then what role does creature C have to do with that? And um, before I kick it off on that, like I thought of, I had read a while ago, there's a comic book called profit. It's ridiculous to even talk about because it, it was, the series was originally created by the doofus Rob Liefeld, you know, the guy from like the Levi's ad in the eighties, a horrible artist, like God forbid when he ever tries to write, but he had this old series from image comics, but somehow he ended up just saying, Hey, take this. You keep the same name, but you do whatever you want. And so I've heard about this this one episode, you know, for like, it was like 26 or something. This new couple of people jumped on Uh and it was something totally different. And the first three issues of it are the ones that I like because it was entirely visually is it was entirely visual storytelling. And the premise was, at least it seemed to be from what you could gather is that, um, and sort of pod drills up from the earth and it opens and a guy emerges, but it's like hundreds of million years into the future. So the entire Earth is basically an alien planet at that point. And importantly, right. he knows absolutely nothing about the ecosystems, nothing about the the, geo- the geography. I mean, it's just an entirely different planet. And so I thought of that premise. And the neat thing about that comic book was that he would have to it, – it's just like what I'm talking about with the ant lines. He, it would just be through demonstration of like him interacting with the world that you'd get a sense for like what is this place and how do things work now in ways that they didn't before. And in the first episode, he's dealing with these creatures that – he ultimately realizes that they're blind, that they're based, you know, their sensory uh, organs are like entirely like smell based. And so he kills one and covers himself with it and interacts with them. So like I immediately thought, I'm like, okay, imagine like you had a game that started like that, but you're in, uh, and they were, they were kind of like living in this giant fungus array or something. And the neat thing about that was, is that as um, he eventually emerged from that, you're thinking this is the extent of the world initially. Like, okay, so in in game terms, you come up in this pod, you get out in this world and you see, you gradually learn that, okay, they can't, you know, they can't, they can't see me, but they can smell me and stuff. But what he finds is later on, these animals in this pod are basically just part of a giant bio farm for a, a separate creature that lives in a different, that lives on the surface. And this is revealed when they start pulling them out to harvest them. And so like, as soon as you have your bearings and like your, your assessment of, okay, this is the way things in this world work, that's upended. And suddenly now that was actually just one very small piece in a much larger thing. And it has this kind of like Russian doll yeah. aspect to it. And it, the, the, the more you go, the more complex things get. And I was just thinking like, it would be really fun to experience in a game did you play, in the exact same way. Did you play Waking Mars? I haven't yet. That's one. That's on my list. We mentioned a Steam, a bloated Steam list of stuff that's just yeah, like yeah, yeah, telling yeah. you to play it. I mean, that's a game that it. I mean, it's a little frustrating because the playing that game, I was mentally extrapolating out to the kind of thing you're describing. Mm-hmm. But in, and I I respect the game a lot for for being uh, so simulational and for, for being just about this ecosystem that you're interacting with and like the elements of the ecosystem interacting with each other and in, in, in sometimes surprising ways, but it's never to any end. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's, no, there's, it's th- these, these different 
you know, flora really only exist to kill each other off or to not die or what you know as but there's it, nothing as it tends to be in life right i mean with all creatures sure but but there's nothing you're not going to find yourself sort of this is this is a silly word to use i guess but you're not going to find yourself like enlightened by that in any right. way. if like, you're looking no, for a, a message and you're looking to tie a bow around the experience like you're not going to get but that, there's also right? yeah and there's you 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 end up just interacting with these things for the sole purpose of Growing enough of them basically to hit a point well, value. Yeah, there's right. never so the moment room, where all that like, stuff becomes recontextualized. Exactly. So, so right. let's say right. that's but not it, but necessary. It seems like a re- like, because like in the in the game that I was describing, you know, the one I'm imagining, say eventually you you finally start interacting with a species of creatures that's vocalizing, except yeah. you just can't understand a word of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And over the course of exposure, you just suddenly notice, like, whoa. I heard two words that were intelligible in there. Yeah. And then over time, then there's more words and right. it's basically simulating yeah, yeah, just, your acclimation to the language. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then there comes this like threshold at which now you are like a literate person and there's like a whole bunch mm-hmm. of information that can be made accessible to you. That'd be one way you might be able no, to. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, even um, it's, it's not quite the same thing, but it just reminds me of the sensation I had when playing it uh, in Fez. There's a, an entire, um, an entire property of that world, which is this very simple, um, like glyph substitution language. That's just, it's very straightforward. It's just one, uh, you know, Roman letter equals one glyph from this world. Mm, But after you spend enough time with it, you, you start being able to read it simply by virtue of having translated so many of these notes throughout the world. And it was to me, extraordinarily intrinsically satisfying just to have that level of fluency with, a you know, simple but still foreign character set, you know, existing just. Um, but that was Braille, in the background actually, of the, in the background of the world. Um, and it would be, I feel like a lot of the elements you're describing are sort of individually present in games, but there's never. I, I, it doesn't seem like anyone's bit off the. Yeah, they're exceptional the moments. Of, exactly right. Like, for the most part, the games just dump their narrative on you exactly right? like yeah. they it, yeah. it, story happens that's true like, of all of talking the games about, that we've mentioned as compo- out of component yeah, parts like, of this yeah. you have to actually invent you have to make it you yeah. know uh, occur over time well and there's also the there's then there's the other you come at it from the other degree which is where we, you know last week we talked about miasmata right? right and sort of we were layering all these things about our our conception of the player character and you know what it, his his weird idiosyncrasies and fixations and so on and um, a lot of times you can come at it from the other, from that direction, from the player um, point of view, and sort of re- deliberately read a lot into it. But um, there are relatively few games that live in the middle ground of not being very prescriptive, but also still being clearly pointing towards something. Right. right. You know, like there's there just there's like, like, a like simulation the simulation sandbox. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I guess it's just because it's really, really hard to do. Right. Like you can't ever assume it's fine when this stuff is window dressing, like from a designer standpoint, because it's like, oh, this is man for the percentage of players who, who they can totally uncover some these lore. things out. This <laughs> is going to be a really nice moment. But you never have to assume that you never have to expect that that's what the bulk of your audience is going to do. Right. Like, how would you you know, how would you approach right. that? Yeah, imagine there'd be le- levels, right? There's like on the one thing, so like if you based your initial level around the fact that like you, you, one of the key moments for you is a discovery that, you know, you can basically camouflage yourself among these creatures. That, I consider that a narrative moment. I consider oh, that that's, sure. yeah, of course. and that's yeah. the kind of thing where you want like, it's what you want, you want 100% like, um, comprehension on that, right? Yeah. But like, let's say that as the further along the story goes and, Ultimately, like you pass some like linguistic threshold and stuff, and then that allows you to have things that are – it's not necessary that you have a 100% yeah. comprehension rate, but basically anything that's like – not even anything. I mean like imagine if you create enough options and there are several different ways to interact with these creatures and exploit the ways that they interact with one another and these, these different things in the ecosystem um, – you create enough there that is like as long as some person understands like one or two, enough to basically play – um, then you probably move into that because we don't know, right? People play our games and like we never have – we can watch them and see are they able to get past this level. But it's just down to the old tricks of like having them fill out surveys and explain their experience to know whether or not they really understood our story in the way that we expected them to, you know. Yeah. So it's like it's fairly easy to just like have people play something and see, okay, I know they understand it because they did it versus – I don't know what they think when someone walks away from playing like Bioshock Infinite or something. I don't know what sense they're making of 
any given thing, you know? Sure. I mean, it's also, there's also just fundamentally different, I mean, you, you, you suggested this would be sort of a level based game, you know, you've got, it's tiered, you know, you've got goals you achieve, but I mean, I could also imagine a version of this that is, is a lot less that way, you know, that, that is, there are simply goals that exist within a contiguous world right. that at any given moment, there is any number of different goals you could be trying to achieve. That it's a lot closer to the spore everyone imagined before right. spore yeah, was yeah, released, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. when it was like the greatest thing to talk about right. because it was really <laughs> right. just this canvas for us to paint our own like uh, ideas and, and our yeah. own hopes and wishes on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a tantalizing, a tantalizing thought. Yeah. I guess the, the underlying thing is just that moment for me. Like I love like, it's so few games give you afford you that opportunity where you just silently have something click, yeah, and you yeah. feel as though like well, even in even in Mia's Mono, yeah, I was that's, say, that's I what I felt that, with like the Miyazmata. cartography. And right. with, I mean, it's a little it's a little different because they they just what's going on? Yeah, someone's like a fat man taking a bath upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, um, taking an angry bath, getting out of the tub yeah. to help with this automated lift. This <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's, uh, you know, cartography in Miyazmata is a really good. It is, yeah. and it's it's funny because that game it's so weird because it's a game that simultaneously is so um, is so player driven and and uh, and expects so much out of you as a player, but also starts with just you know a dozen straight paragraphs in a row explaining all these things to you, right? right? Like, I mean, I you could you could imagine them having made that game and not ever just. Explain right. cartography this ever? Is, just avoid that metal layer altogether. Would have you know? Take, you know, oh my gosh! It would have just been a different yeah. game. I mean, I think well, they had to impart that knowledge on you because you are inhabiting the body of somebody who's sick, who's there for a purpose. Who you're, you are being asked to carry somebody's sure. baggage, sure, yeah. which is knowledge that you presuppose. Well, that's that the, guy has. that's the weird thing about it, right? Is that cart is that cartography is something that you could reasonably assume this person in this situation should actually know how to do this just as a member of that society. Right. But then, you know, in the game that, that Sean is describing, that's an entirely fictional, all those things are, are entirely created concepts for the purpose of that world. So you're right. kind of, you're, you're kind of relinquishing right. the, the expectation that this specific character in this situation might actually know those things out of the gate. Oh yeah, exactly. And removing I, that because the whole thing is the, the unfamiliarity and the alien aspect of it. Yeah. Like it, I mean, to get like pointy headed, like, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Proust and in search of lost time is that like true art is not the equivalent of, uh, an astronaut who's visited Mars telling you about that trip he took to Mars, but rather it makes out of every single person the astronaut and you visit Mars yourself, you know? So it's like, it's really about, in, in this case, because it's sort of sci-fi, it doesn't yeah. have to be that one-to-one, -one, but it's, it's really about saying like, you're in a new space and it's not like, Oh, like this stuff looks neat, but like it really it's a little like I, you start from scratch. You don't know how the right. fundamental aspects of that world work other than something as simple as like gravity. And even that's up for grabs, you know? Well, that's the exact opposite of what most science fiction games are, which are, you know, they sort of often will have fantastical um, architecture or or landscapes or what have you. But the actual interactions are the most quotidian possible, yeah. you know, things within the, with the framework of the genre of game they are usually. Or, or, or which and, and like Kubrick took that to like a great end where basically you have, you know, in 2001 – Everything is like phenomenal, otherworldly, and so far as like how technologically advanced it is, and yet it's utterly lifeless and tedious. You know, I mean, the people in there are very deliberately that's true, removed yeah. from anything. Like when you look at like uh, the conversation that Bowman has with his daughter, it's just so like eh, happy birthday, and like you have these, these <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, and it's it's very specifically juxtaposed with just these angry, violent, but very emotional apes in this beginning scene with almost no technology. And then the next thing you go, it's just like you're in wonderland that these people are fucking dead. And the only alive thing is, is how is this computer, you know, but like, I think that was like a great and very specific response to that element of sci-fi, you know, where it's just, so what, right. Okay. All there's all this technical stuff, but so what, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, another cool thing about that too, is I think like everyone, I, I have, I have a close friend who's an entomologist and he's, he, he spends a lot of time in different parts of the world. Uh, just trying to study animal behavior uh, and study wasp behavior in particular for him. And I think when, you know, when he's described for me those moments when he sees a behavior again and again, but he doesn't know what to make of it. And when that time comes, when he starts to formulate hypotheses about, whoa, maybe it's this or this, like it, it's a really attractive um, sort of epiphany to have. And I think there's some of that in my 
my fantasy for that kind of game too. Have you yeah. played Mia's Mata yet? I haven't. You now, I was going to ask you guys because yeah, you, 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 you were speaking about I'm in a way play, that yeah, like, presupposed I, even, I don't even know what it oh, is. Sorry, oh, yeah. So when you're yeah. talking about cartography, I mean, I know what cartography is, yeah. but I don't, I don't yeah. know what the it's game is. It's a first-person like, game where you just you wake up on an island and you realize you're told you're there, you're sick. There were two brothers or two scientists working on this island to find an a cure. Enclave of learned men. I yeah. believe was the <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> That's the terminology. Enclave of learned men that were on this island there to. To create a cure for your your ailment, and uh, you wander, you can basically you can harvest uh, flowers and other bits of flora, make medicines, uh, and then un- uncover this map. And their sort of journal yeah, pages thing, lie around. Things don't get added to the map simply by walking to them. You have to either find map fragments with your guy, which your guy then copies onto the main map, or you have to use actual triangulation, like cardinal triangulation with a compass and landmarks and you can mm-hmm. then fill in chunks of the map as you explore cool. so, so if you can see places that you know where they are from an unknown part of the map you can reveal that part can, of the map you can right. then draw a vector on the map from that from, uh, uh, based on the bearing of the compass from that point that sounds great and then if you yeah if you intersect that with another bearing for a different landmark then there you are. that must be where you, but you are. learn yes. really so many things about not it's what's, what I like, I like i mean something i like not just about like being a like an assumed average human entity in a world like you learn things about who this guy is not like his history or anything but like you learn like how sick he is simply by existing in this space not being able to climb certain hills getting tired when you run certain distances uh not being too good with water (laughs) in general but uh, well, you're also then, then just learning, presumably, about the environment. Yeah, well. and then yeah, there's also just things in the environment that you're learning about that are dangerous, and that your um, immune system is not acclimated to it. Right? I mean, there's just you know, I mean, it's it's just a game where you have to you have to think about interactions that you would never think about in any other game, like walking up an incline. Like that's just every game treats that as just the, the a complete right. matter of course. But you you end up thinking about all those things just in in the space of walking from point A to point B, which is really fascinating. Just how do you get somewhere safe when you're lost in the woods at night and don't know where you are on the map. So a bit of the survivalist fantasy mixed in with like the other, um, I noticed as you're describing this, like, and I was like, Oh, it's similar also to what I was describing. It's just like when loss started, when it, Seem to have yeah. boundless potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, absolutely. Right. That's it's just more of that. Yep. Like, yep. and I mean, I don't know. Like, I haven't finished me as Mata yet. Um, but it's one of those things where I don't have sort of these these grandiose hopes for like a a, gra- a, a great reveal at all. No, no, the game. no. It doesn't. I. It doesn't. No, add, right, it doesn't, doesn't feel the, like the, the feeling reason. that on this which island is nice, there, actually, which is sort I of agree, refreshing. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. You you do get the feeling though that just that that sense of I'm on this one tiny beach and I can see you can see the horizon going off in both directions wrapping around and then you, you your brain immediately wonders what the hell is yeah. on the rest of this thing well there's like the moment that you that screenshot that you showed me of the the room right and i don't want to i want to talk about spoilers but like right. it's clear that that there are there are mysteries i mean even right from the beginning you things find a guy with a knife in his yeah. back i mean things have happened that you're meant to be trying to piece together right and what's funny is that when i play it and i see these things i also don't find myself necessarily pining for the 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 core of this thing that's going to tie right. all of these together it's, jake it's hypothesized something that actually really bummed me out i like, know oh, you told me yeah. yeah it actually really it's funny it Probably reminds isn't. me of the book we're reading for the adult book club right now the crying of lot 49 by thomas pynchon like which is so much about these like threads of um conspiracy and like potential causation but right but with but like just being lost within it, like mm-hmm. just just com- just completely at sea right. within, it. and that's a feeling that is never no no game developers ever seem to be able to to be willing to grab onto that. Like there always right. needs to be like this succinct kernel of right. explanation. Well, most modern game, most case. modern game design, I expect that's explicitly is Mata as well. But right. I, you know, I just haven't finished. I don't know, it yet. feels but, like um, it's something that bums me out, and I like the idea of a game that. Um, is willing to to wallow in the first half of that and acknowledging that there may there may in fact not be a packaged constructed. Um, well, but you I also find like out games, what it is over time, yeah. you know. Like, well, I like games to go the other way too, where you're sort of figuring, like you're under, getting an understanding of the person who you're inhabiting, like of the ba- of the baggage you're carrying. Mm-hmm. Like I think that's something that games can do really well. I mean, you're literally in another, per- like, especially in a first person game, you're literally just standing there in their shoes. And I think you can experience things in a game that make you fe- as a player feel a certain way. 
that when executed appropriately also make the the person who you're navigating feel a certain way, I guess. And I mean, it's not so much explicit emotion, but I do think there's always moments in a game when things like will happen to my character and I go, Oh my God, I'm this type of person, you know? And I think that's sort of interesting, not based on the choices I made in the game, but what I'm being, who I'm being asked to be. I find that really intriguing. And I'm kind of a mixed mind about it. Right. Because that's never going to be this like realizing, Oh, I'm this kind of person. Mm -hmm. Like you can have that moment as a human being in your life, mm-hmm. but it's going to be, it's going to be like within context of a life lived. Yeah. yeah it's like the to, sense yeah. of an ending. Just to right. refer to another book from our bookcast, like oh. idlebookclub.com. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's something that is, it's not the same as like recognize as, as sort of realizing, Oh, this, there, an event has happened to me. Right. You know, it's coming to like a, a moment of, um, kind of subtle self-awareness, which is very different from being like, oh, I see. I'm a person who had this experience in my past. So I'm, I'm of mixed mind. Well, that's why about, the amnesiac, about, amnesiac and that's why it's so overplayed. Always but, like, overplayed yeah. It's also... I was going to say, like, literature is, like, one of its greatest strengths, so, you know, like, literary fiction, at yeah. least, is to put you in the subject position of someone that's entirely different from yourself. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. games are, at least AAA games, you know, or the exact opposite. They always look to situate you in someone that is like either a really highly familiar fantasy mm-hmm. that the, the widest number of people can relate to and never pushing you to an extreme or something where it would be uncomfortable, right? You don't like how often do you have – I mean this is a generic example. I don't think this is a great idea or anything. But like how often have you played a game, for example, where you are an African-American at some point in history where you're constantly being like – you know, uh, berated or you're dealing right. yeah. like with, you know, in an indirect or direct way with what it meant to be that person in that frame of time. Instead, it's always, you know, you are a certain, there's like a, a pretty narrow band of people oh, who you can be. Yeah, and sure. even when they're women, they tend to basically be just like ungendered, you know, they're basically the same as men, except they have, you know, they have breasts on them or something. I'm not pointing at anything as specific. I'm really looking no, at like the to, history like of all, all the of games I, <laughs> I've ever games. played. Yeah. And yeah, there's just such opportunity. Like again, in fiction, think of all your favorite books and how many different people whose shoes you've walked in. Yeah, and when I've, how many shoes have I walked in in games? You know, God, I read this amazing book um, about a year ago. It was a debut novel by uh, Alice de la Plante, and it was called Turn of Mind. And it was a it was told in first person from the perspective of like a I want to say sixty eight year old woman suffering from dementia. So the entire oh, book was told in fragments. I remember when you were reading this. <laughs> yeah, and it was intense. It was I mean, it you. is absolutely intense. It's a quick read because everything is so fragmentary. But it was it was difficult. I mean, it was it was tough because it really does immerse you in this bizarre, completely nonlinear fragmented state of mind you know i mean that's the kind of thing you could do in a game in fact um also like killer seven for the gamecube <laughs> well but like, even with dementia 30, and stuff, 30 flights like, of loving kind of is i mean right. it doesn't it doesn't bite off dementia but it's like it it describes sort of a fragmented sure. reco- recollection that's entirely of, right. in form in 30 flights of loving like that doesn't have i know it doesn't say yeah, like, as long as what you're not talking about is just like a kaleidoscopic presentation of like random weirdness because no, even people no, 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 with no, no, mental no. illnesses, like I read a lot of no, like Oliver Sacks' I mean. books and stuff, yeah. they very much understand their experience in specific ways. They're just very different. They tend yeah. to be coherent, but they're just in ways that at first are unintelligible to us. And it's like I imagine like a real cop out would be, let's just have a whole bunch of weird shit constantly happening. You know, you have twenty different. Well, that happens uh, all the time. Like right, which we acid see trip right. sequences and shit, which is which is or even yeah, like, like the, what if a crazy elephant floated in? You don't I get mean, the sense of a character <laughs> making like a, a personal like narrative out yeah. of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. are there rats there with that yeah, crazy they're... elephant? <laughs> it's so scary. <laughs> God, I don't. know. I think games. I mean, games don't, and maybe games aren't best at. And I don't think it's not so much like literature should tackle the idea of like protagonist empathy more than games but i think games can do it like i think games just yeah. don't no they absolutely yeah. can that's the yeah. thing there's no i think market is the real is the real reason why right. not i mean because it's like it's been a staple it's not been like a mission state it's just sort of like from one way or another it's kind of just emerged as a practice in literary fiction right. over time and it's like that just hasn't happened and i think a, a lot of it i mean for one obvious reason is that we're very afraid. I mean, it costs a lot more to make a uh, AAA game than it does to make a, a yeah, book. Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, and books are just pure extremist. And for some people, it might cost them like almost nothing to make, but it could end up making them millions and millions of dollars. You know, and uh, 
with the game though, it's always going to cost you when it's a certain, you know, reach shooting for a certain quality. It's always going to cost you a fixed amount. You know, you're not going to basically be the person that buys the $1 scratch off and wins 10 million. You're going to be the person that spent, you know, 3 million to get 5 million or something. Right. Um, and so for that reason alone, where it's just, people are afraid of how, you know, who's going to well, relate to this. And, so, and, and so here's a readers are more mature. Anyway, you don't pick up something cause you're like, Oh, I really feel like I, like I can understand what it's like to be a cowboy scalping Indians today. I you know, I've right. got the backwards, yeah. but yeah. anyway, discerning readers pick up a book because the cover is interesting. Yes. <laughs> I don't book. Wait, so here, <laughs> there's just on this topic. This is a game I meant to bring up a while, but I forgot. Um, uh, do you guys know Maddie Bryce? She's a, she's a game critic and, and, as of recently, um, game designer, and she she made a game called Mainichi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I think it's a Japanese word, but like it's it's um, it was made with RPG Maker, I think. And you just you control like the character that is that represents her, like you know her her avatar in the game, basically. And you go through just her daily life, just day by day by day, like as a transgendered person. And it's really oh, I think I have heard of this. Yeah, it's really cool. You. Um, you you get up. You have to get dressed. You take a shower. You like put on makeup or do or don't any of these these things, right? Like you, every little thing that like to a person who doesn't have to deal with like severe uh, gender bias, like mm-hmm. is just a very typical just, part yeah. of just preparing for your day that you I don't bet think twice about. But it. it's like an overwhelming choice that she has to make every single day. That is like. X amount of time that's going to have X payoff or not in the day. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's a really, it's I free. I bet you when, get when it. you it's, play it, really you'd cool. probably be far more inclined to play what would be considered true to character than you would when you play like a, a shooter where you're yeah. just some generic action hero. Right. And then yeah. when I play those, my first instinct is always to shoot anyone I possibly can, mm-hmm. not because I'm a miscreant or a psychopath. It's because I just want to see if the system can accommodate the yeah. behavior. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. But I think if I was presented with something which was sufficiently like apart from my normal experience, which like the generic action here was right. like, when it's we specifically all know asking it, you experience I a different would, thing. Yeah. Then I would like probably be, I, I imagine myself wanting to like play that role, you know? Well, like, the other the, thing is the difference about with something like this and with the experience you're describing is that in the experience you're describing, it doesn't really matter how you get from point A to point B as long as you do. You know, like if the, if all the guys on the other end of your reticule are dead, like who cares what how much of a psychopath you were? Like the game isn't going to judge that. And most games that do judge it in a fairly crass way, like it tends to, you know, it tends to be a very like mm-hmm. the morality systems in games tend to be kind of a, a joke to me. And like, but th- this game is is not so much about that. Like you're going to get through the day no matter what. It's just how uncomfortable is your is your experience going to be? And it's not perfectly predictable like there you the point is that these minor interactions these minor choices in your day have subtle effects on your emotional state later for just weird reasons that you couldn't possibly predict and that's what actual human life is like you know i mean small um choices you make in your day don't end up like saving the world or not saving the world they they end up just rippling out in in like very mundane versions of the butterfly effect right like it's a, a minor social interaction with someone uh, can have some impact that actually puts a very positive or negative spin on your day. And it can stick in your brain for forever as you think of this shitty experience you had with this person. And that can actually really put a damper on things. And like playing this, playing this game, I thought was very effective at communicating that, as, but from a perspective that most of us don't ever have to consider. Um, so I'd recommend it. It's free. You can get it. It's called Mainichi. M-A-I-N-I-C-H-I. And it's just the not having the like explicit goal that you know you're just trying to to find the most expedient route to is just fundamentally different from like a power fantasy game. Um, anyway, it's cool. Sounds cool. Yeah, and and it's it's a way that um, it, it I think it is a way to achieve um, some of the things that literary fiction does in an interactive environment um, by just dispensing with a lot of tropes that that a uh, you know a higher budget game would have to would would at least with the designers of which would probably feel pressured to mm-hmm. to include yeah all right good job <laughs> setting up setting off us off us on mm-hmm. for the setting us off on that journey yeah. that was well done <clears throat> i don't know just the moment you start talking about far cry through we ended up all the way over here it's good yeah yeah should should we, you're better at the, do we need to do it this week yes we, we did a lot no we need to do reader mail all right jake wants to do reader mail all right <laughs> you have to do reader mail what? Jake, Jake is the gatekeeper. Of the I show. demand a reader mail. All right. Okay. 
I haven't looked at them yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably terrible. All right. There's one that we have to read before, before um, Sean. You're up next week, right, Sean? Yeah. Yeah. So there's one we have to read um, while you're here because it won't make any sense to the rest of us. Dear Sean. <laughs> you're the worst member of this podcast. Please. Fact. <laughs> Hopefully just, you're replaced with a different Sean. Please put your shoes on. You're on now. <laughs> oh, you put it back on? Yeah. He was stinking up the. You place thought the podcast was over. I, just, oh, yeah. I didn't think we were doing reader mail. So put the shoes back on. Just figure your readers know. Like, oh, you were getting ready to bolt about you guys. No, you were get, like getting your all running fucking shoes. cards still. That's why. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So uh, Alex writes with no preamble. There is a lord in Dota Two named Queen of Pain who is referred to as QOP, pronounced Quop. Mrs. Vanaman does not like her voice or bad dialogue. She's not Mrs. Vanaman, is she? she no, she's no, she's Mrs. Moore. There is a phenomenon wherein Quop will, due to the circumstances dictated in a particular game, go top. Quop top, while rare but not unheard of, can in a specific confluence events be matched in a game with a second hero, Priestess of the Moon, similarly shortened to POTM, pronounced Potom. If circumstances maintain these, this unlikely course, the Potom can in fact go bottom. The effect of a simultaneous Potom bottom and Quop top are subject of ongoing investigation by top Dota scientists. You like that shot? <laughs> I just wanted to read this stupid email. <laughs> Thanks. Quap top and bottom bottom. Have you ever encountered that conf- configuration? No, but I bet you can listen to it on, on the audiblepodcast.com slash wizard. It's a Quop- wonderful <laughs> oh, it's a novel. Book. It's a Beatrix Potter <laughs> yeah. uh, children's no- novel. Yeah. All right. There's that. <laughs> the entire email. And that's it for reader mail this week. I got, I got <laughs> a reader mail for me, like delivered right here. Yeah. Like, will, you, will you kindly consider for the book podcast um, – Delving into the fan fiction of Justin DeviantArt user Justin RPG. <laughs> We've got another feature podcast that that might be better suited for. But what the hell are you talking about? Oh, yeah. I didn't even like. I just it, he's basically there are a lot of awesome care, uh, personalities to be found on YouTube and DeviantArt. This guy is probably one of the most mesmerizing I've ever encountered. <laughs> You've never it's mentioned like, it before. You. He's, God, this irrational. is a new find. Okay. This is a new find. This guy. Um. And it's he has all of the characteristics. Like when I say that he's married to Resh Ram, the vast white Pokemon. Like that shouldn't be surprising because we've known people have been married characters forever. Like that. Have if I say that? that he have we known that? the dawn of characters. If I say that he fetishizes having Moltres and other Pokemon. Um, um, sit on his face like that is shouldn't be that surprising and it's not just that it's <laughs> a, a number of weird things yeah it ought not it's that the shape and that yes. these these like fantasies and I also should point out that he has a, a poster of a cheeseburger on his wall uh, unironically oh, his um, but anyway if you read great if you read his fiction it's remarkable <laughs> and he um he gives voice to some of these in the form of song and they're like, I don't know, I can't sell it. People just think, like, yeah, hey, whatever. It's just he's found someone else oh, to no, make it's... fun of on the internet. But if you look in his songs, I, I've listened to, like, some of his songs maybe, like, more than 20 times each because, like, <laughs> I haven't stuck my head right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, Jake's cooking up a podcast idea that that might be perfectly suited for. That podcast is going to be real, too. So Get him in there, right? Can't wait till that launches. Find Come on, pick your choice reader mail. Pick your favorite one. Um, Dusty Morgan writes, my Kickstarter rewards never arrived. God damn it, Jake. All right. What are you guys ripping people off for? It's accidentally. <laughs> ben Halberton says, hey, Thumbs, listening to your most recent podcast made me curious about your opinion on spoilers. Uh, really spoiler versus media culture. Tom Bissell's Extra Lives was brought up before, so... Um, I'm, this is in reference He's to his short, Thomas short diatribe at the end of the book against gaming's unhealthy obsession with spoilers, which he calls infantilizing. I don't know if I agree with that, but the argument that foreknowledge shouldn't distract from truly great works of art works of art has been something I've carried with me afterwards. I enjoyed the movie Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy a lot more because another podcast spoiled the identity of the mole, which would have distracted me, um, despite being secondary to what interested in me in the yeah. movie. Um, how do you feel about spoilers and previews, reviews, casual discussions, video games? How about other media? Are these feelings absolute? Are there other instances where spoilers enhanced rather than ruined an experience? Thanks for your time, Ben Halliburton. It kind of depends. I think kinda it's media specific. Well. I think we owe the Escape from this Mysterious Room people an apology. We tried to edit, yeah, our, po- we tried to edit our podcast to accommodate uh, their polite request that we remove some of the details of their mm-hmm. game. And it was it, it, impossible. It, 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 it ruined the entire mess. discussion. Yeah, it was so, really impossible. Yeah. So we owe them a very sincere apology because they asked us you know i don't know i was actually talking to my wife about this on the way here on the phone um because i'm watching downton abbey mm-hmm. and uh i got to a part where i was like well are you fucking kidding me yeah it gets bad in season two yeah and uh and she said oh well she said something about i can't remember what it is she says oh well don't worry that's gonna get way worse 
And I was like, <laughs> come on, hon. And she's like, oh, don't worry. I mean, it's not for a few episodes. But then this thing happens. And I was like, look, the whole reason I'm watching this is because of the dumb shit that's going to happen to these people right. now. Like, now that's what I'm into this for. Yeah. So you're now just... I know things are going to happen to them. And now it's like actually listening to that reader. I just punched my microphone. Yeah. Not that it mattered because of goddamn like cloggers upstairs. But um, uh, listening to that reader mail sort yeah. of makes me feel like getting like an asshole for getting. No, but they're different, right? That. Because yeah. something like Downton Abbey is just plot just out the ass. Like there's right. so much plot. It's just plot, plot, plot. Whereas something like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which he specifically mentions, mm -hmm. I saw the movie four times in theaters, right? right. Like, I knew what was going to happen. Right. Like, I wasn't, yeah. I read the book even before I saw it. Like, I knew what was going to happen anyway. It's um, on the sixth But that's sense. like, it's just tone. Right. Like, it's that movie is just, you're just awash in, in tone for just two and a half hours. You know what I mean? But I think I we've was, been really pointed at not spoiling a certain aspect of Mia's Mana just because the reveal is such, yeah, is so too, We've received some criticism for not talking about that as well, in fact. Like, for the experience that it, that it allows the game. But whatever. Who cares? Um, we'll just give it another week and then we'll bring it up. That's yeah, fine. There's, um, but I feel like the thing is, is like in that unique position, right? Mia's Mana is a game that not a lot of people know about, and not a lot of people are downloading and playing. Yeah. So, relatively speaking, right? Relatively yeah. speaking, to Far Cry Three. Yeah. So we can throw it on the podcast, hoping to you know, yeah, some thumbs readers will pick it up, having not even heard of it before, play it sight unseen, yeah, have a very unique experience and enjoy that, and then yeah, you know, it's different. Well, I, I don't like, really feel I, I don't like, feel bad about spoiling Far Cry Three. No, it's different. Uh, yeah. Well, and also, it's we we know whether. Like, I saw you playing me as Mana. Like, the moment where you, you reached the thing that we haven't spoiled was truly surprising and shocking to you. Yeah. Like, that was an amazing moment of revelation. Whereas, I, I that's not going to be the same with, like, some arbitrary plot point in Far Cry 3, which is, you know, switch that out with any other right. first person shooter right. story. But, like, um, I also, I, I don't know. I like the way we often do it where we say we're going to talk about a thing in general terms, but next week, if you haven't yet experienced it, then... Like, too bad. You either yeah. skip that segment or have it spoiled. And, like, I think that's totally fair. And fine. Of course, like, no one – it's not an experiment that you can rerun. Like, you know, the, the reader who wrote in will never know what it was it's like true. to watch that movie and have it's not true. known anything. So he, it's basically just a false comparison no where he says, I, I enjoyed it more because more than what. Exactly. But, but listening to you guys, what's interesting is I was like, ah, oh, this sounds a little duplicitous. But I was like, I was just noticing that – you guys have times when you draw the line in the sand and you say, I don't want to spoil that. And you have times when you don't mind it. And I think that you should like, by looking specifically at those times, like when we, when we sort of ask ourselves, am I willing to, to spoil this to someone? We know if it's meaningful to us in the first place, you know? Yeah. Um, so like oftentimes I've done this on podcasts and you feel like you're blindsided. You didn't realize you spoiled anything. And then suddenly there's just this outrage and you're like, but that is so inconsequential. Right. Or just that's you know, not, it's, that's it's, yeah, yeah. You're, you're not what the thing's actually about. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, but there's, Whatever. there's like yeah. the, the mentality where like people don't want to hear a single word. And then there's, I think we're like, we're on the exact same page where something is significant enough that, you know, it, well, it was, it was a great moment for you to have experienced it going in without, you know, with their, your blinders on. So why would you want to deprive someone else of that? But yeah, for whatever reason, some people are like in the games community are uh, that sensitivity level tunes. Like, yeah. So I think that's sort of ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, yeah what you're describing. Especially because when it comes to plot points, so infrequently are any of them in games actually like transcendent. <laughs> like, I mean, right. it's, it's, right. it's very rare. Yeah. They don't even have to be that. I mean, there's also just a good twist and, they, and a good twist isn't necessarily like meaningful. It's just like, I, I always point things to like alien. Like the first time I saw alien, I didn't know shit about it oh, at oh, all. Yeah, so totally. if I'd gone in it, and I had, you know, the thing summarized for me, I know the entire time I'd be waiting for the big moment, you know, and I'll, is this going to be that moment? Is this going to be that moment? And it's not a bad experience. That's the other thing too, about how I said you can't run that experience twice. If a movie's good, you're going to enjoy it either way. So you're going to come away from it thinking that it was great and it was immaterial, yeah, yeah. whether or not it was spoiled for you. But, um, I personally, I was like, I would like when I think of other people watching that movie, I imagine a world where they didn't know, where they know absolutely nothing about it. Same thing yeah. with like, even like Star Wars or something, not a great, great movie. But if you could, if there's someone, you know, our children and stuff, you know, right, I was going to say, like, that's your opportunity really to, the only opportunity to someone who hasn't seen the toys that. and who hasn't heard yeah, just yeah, everything yeah. and every like ironic, you know, thing and every piece of merchandise is like, here, see what this is, you know, yep. so maybe you like this. Yeah. No, absolutely. There's just there's just points in any piece of entertainment medium where the 
point of a moment is discovering it and not knowing mm-hmm. about it. And those are things you obviously shouldn't spoil. But like, yeah, but you can't be dogmatic about it if you're on a video game podcast because yeah, no. if your audience is people who want to listen to people talk about things that they've experienced, right? Of course, you, you obviously you know you've right. got to draw the line. And so if I mean, they're also choosing to listen to that, this podcast because there's a certain amount of curatorial trust that's there. You yeah. know what I mean? You, yeah, sure. Yeah. If, if, you're, if, if you're we're gonna, constantly spoiling things for you, then you're probably not listening to us. When, when was the last time any of you guys actually watched the original Star Wars trilogy? A like a long time, long, months long ago, time ago. A few months ago. Oh, it was a yeah, long I've watched time it all recently. Empire Strikes Back is fucking good. Yeah. Sorry, I had forgotten how good that movie is. Yeah. It's it was it was actually really depressing to me because I've just I wrote all that stuff. Star off. Wars just gets wallpapered. Yeah, in I just mind I just, just like never ending morass. Mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about Star shit. Wars for a long time, but it is just no, like if you if you take if you take Star Wars for granted at this point because it's basically been fully ruined, mm-hmm. do yourself a favor and go back and watch the first two again. It's a surprise. It's nice. Yeah. It's weird. Sorry. I remember seeing that in the theater. It's a surprise. Yeah, it's kidding. nice. It's weird. Sorry. Those are the most consecutive <laughs> sentences you've said on this podcast. I know. I haven't been in this podcast. <laughs> Jake Rock can have it. <laughs> cool. Go to the last thing yeah. on that. I was just going to say is too. Is like, if you're going to be like, if you're going to critique work properly, like the, the the spoiler question is like aside the point in the yeah, first place, it's and deleted. it's not like on a podcast all you do is a, a formal critique of things. Right. But when you sort of like indicate that that's what you're going to do, there's really no other way to yeah, do it. Imagine uh, reading yeah, like you know literary class. criticisms where, where there's like I don't want to they're spoil it for you. to spoil something, you know, or, <laughs> yeah. or a film crit, you know. Yeah. But like it just wouldn't exist. But yeah. but again, like that's the the line you walk. Where sometimes you might engage in some crit, sometimes you might just be throwing out impressions, right. like just as another fan, you know, like mm-hmm. because you just got a taste of something. Yeah. yeah. How's Bioshock Infinite end? <laughs> I ain't saying. <laughs> I'm waiting for people in that to call me uh, a hypocrite because I've been telling everyone. I'm like, if you already know, oh, I've been telling everybody at the end of the game. In, no, no. If you are, I've been telling people that if they know that uh, they know enough that they want to experience it, then just go on a media blackout because I think that because I don't know, right? Surely, if people find out right. about a weapon or something, I don't care. That's right. not going to ruin like the big picture. But right. I don't know what they could stumble upon, and I think right. that like. I hope you know we all do, right? I'm sure right. the same thing for your game. You don't want me reading like wiki. Well, that's no. It's, in, it's actually know? the like, one thing that's good about working at a smaller size studio is that Jake and I'll go downstairs when we know there's a new episode coming out. Look at the trailer, talk to the guys, talk about the, what the message of that episode is going to be, and be like, okay, yeah, cool. So everybody's sort of on the same page because, again, to your point, Chris, our games are like I don't want to say they're overly plot driven, but what happens to you? is the game yeah like how you react walking, to things. walking dead is quite plot driven yeah. yeah right right i mean i just i didn't want to characterize it as like this pure plot driven sort of like no no thing. there's yeah. i mean a lot of it is just the relationship between the characters and so on but it's like but you're reacting you're, to plot points. especially That's an episode game. driven game it's like right. there's a big plot a, at least a couple right. huge plot moments in every episode working right. on walking dead actually has made me that's the that's the process that got me over worrying about spoilers. When I first started at Telltale, a lot of what I was doing was community stuff. I actually was cutting trailers and stuff, and I was always super, super, super cautious about not putting anything basically interesting into any of right. our marketing materials because I yeah. knew that people would, would bitch about it. But the the discovery that I've sort of come to realize when putting all the media together for Walking Dead with our marketing guys is – general audience that stuff just comes across as impressionistic tone Mm -hmm. and the only people who are spoiled are the people who are spoiling themselves well and who are watching every single scrap of everything and that's why those are the people that you have to say go on a media blackout you have to just go cold turkey on this because your personality will make you buy it already right and exactly those people can afford to sell them on like they've already sold but for the yeah there's the skeptics who don't know shit about it like yeah you want to throw as much as you possibly can like until they're like okay okay like i'm in the stuff that you release that i think often gets com- complained about for being spoilery is the stuff that only shows up as a spoiler when someone frame grabs it and then goes, oh, that character's in this scene and I now know because I've compiled this before that mm-hmm. that character's name is this. Like, no one knows that when that just shows up yeah. as a but YouTube like trailer. A, like, that just comes, just goes snapping past someone's brain as yeah, just absolutely. a moment. It's like they probably feel it's like the contract with you. Like, they... they they think you should know that they're going to do that because they can't right, help right. doing Which that. Which it gets to Bissell's so, point, right? Yeah. 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 It's, I don't know. At this point, I'm, I'm, I've become what I used to hate, which is the guy in the studio who walks over to the director of one of the episodes and just says, dude, just shut up. Just let that shotgun on the trailer. It's good looking. People are going to think that your game's sick. It's weird. It's, no spoilers, though. Jake Rockin. 
sold out. <laughs> Fully sold out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Want to wrap it up? Yeah, man. Cool. Thanks for coming by, dude. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for yeah, having yeah, me yeah, out I here. I know what the, the fuck you're talking about. It's on, <laughs> on the legendary <laughs> podcast. Yeah. We would yeah, have been, we would have been up shit creek without you on this one. Yeah, yeah thanks like, for filling about 80 to 90% of this right. podcast. <laughs> yeah. Either, <laughs> either I will Elliot show come by you whenever you want, yeah. and we'll just kick this thing down on autopilot, and we'll be good. Yeah, yeah. anytime did, you want to come The by. Neo-Geth thread will either be full of people saying, why don't that fucking guy shut his mouth and talk too, too or, much? Or, shut up, Sean Elliott! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just let him talk all the time. Yeah, yeah. thanks, man. Thanks yeah, so much. thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Bye. Video <laughs> it's January fuck bye